Hey guys, after receiving a lot of emails and questions and comments in the uh, comments of my YouTube videos, I decided to finally muster the courage to start filming these videos. So I have been suffering with hypothalamic amenorrhea for the better part of, I'd say about five and a half to six years. Um, I can't really say with certainty, but um, I'll explain more of that in videos to come. But I finally feel like I've reached a point in my journey and in my recovery from hypothalamic amenorrhea that I'm able to discuss it with some form of confidence and understanding and awareness instead of um, just being completely baffled and irritated and frustrated with the medical information and I might say some very controversial things in this video and videos to come. I would like for you to keep an open mind and always do your own fact checking and your own research to determine what is best for your health in your particular circumstance. So let's dive in with what exactly is hypothalamic amenorrhea or red S or relative energy deficiency in sport or hypotrophic hypogonadism. There are a million different terms around this condition. When somebody develops hypothalamic amenorrhea, it basically means your body has reached a state of stress that it can no longer function at its normal rate. So it starts down-regulating different body systems, things like digestion and your reproductive system. You may cease getting your period, or for males, you may cease having your normal natural morning erections. Some other things that are down-regulated are your ability to concentrate and have a sense of humor and just basically be yourself. You completely lose your sense of self in this phenomenon because you're so, basically you're starving and you're so worried about food. So this typically happens when people are undernourished and or at a state of extreme stress. So over exercising or being at war and in a famine, being undernourished is a stressor in and of itself, but then not having the proper materials to let your body function normally is another cause of hypothalamic amenorrhea. And then red S is a uh, relative energy deficiency in sports. So basically 43 to 70% of recreational exercisers, women recreational exercisers suffer from LEA, low energy availability, which is basically just not eating enough to compensate for your physical movements beyond that of, you know, breathing and digestion and heart rate and so on and so forth. So in red S, you are typically over-exercising and um, not fueling properly to make up for that ex exercise. So I have a little bit of both of those um, umbrellas. So hypothalamic amenorrhea is always a component of red S, but people with HA don't always tend to have red S. So it's slightly separate, but um, under the same umbrella as hypothalamic amenorrhea, if that makes any sense. So let's get into the actual storyline on how I developed AJ, or at least how I understand that I developed AJ. Okay. So some, I just took a few notes um, because this has been, like I said, like a six year process and it's been very confusing for me to look back and try to figure out exactly where things went so wrong because I am such an advocate for health. I mean, anybody who watches this channel, I'm sure recognizes that. Sorry if you guys can hear my dog uh, nibbling in the background. He gets kind of noisy. So about six years ago, five, six years ago when I got pregnant, I got really freaked out about, like I'm sure many women do, about what's going to happen to my body, am I going to lose my shape, how much weight am I going to gain, and I just had this urge to control that all of a sudden. I'd never been a dieter, I'd never been very particular about um, like restricting my calories or anything, I just have always kept up with weight management through healthy eating and exercise. Not only was I afraid of gaining weight when I was pregnant, but also I am a very conscientious person and I wanted the utmost optimal environment to raise a baby. So I went forward researching the most optimal diet and the most optimal exercise and I was very diligent about carrying out what I considered to be the most healthful um, routine each day. So things like 
intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, I started doing that at this time. It was minimal when I was pregnant. I didn't want to not eat when I was hungry. So I made sure to always do that. And I just happened to not be hungry in the morning. So I would wait a couple hours until I got to work and then break my fast. And then later in the evening, I would be exercising. So I think the exercise naturally suppressed my appetite. But if I got home and I was hungry, I would always have a snack, but typically I was not hungry. So I was um, loosely intermittent fasting when I was pregnant. So I'm not 100% if this is where my HA started, but I, I, I'm terrified to be honest if this is where it started because I was pregnant and I'm hopeful that my daughter didn't suffer any of the um, ramifications of my underfueling, my potential underfueling. I do remember being very cold during my pregnancy and I have heard from others that they have experienced that too, but most people <laughs> are rather warm when they're pregnant. But I live in Wisconsin and I was pregnant in the winter time, so who knows if that was um, a factor in the HA or not. But it was at this point that I did take out the salt, oil, and sugar out of my diet completely. So I still had some like dried fruit and chips and, um, you know, I didn't recognize all the oil in some of my refried beans or something, for instance. So I took all that stuff out of my diet at that point and I instantly noticed a difference in my weight and my energy and the way I felt. Um, I was also probably exercising way too much for a pregnant woman. I didn't change anything really about my strength training. I continued like an hour of strength training twice a week, hour, hour and a half and really heavy, heavy strength training. I didn't hold back at all. Um, I honestly felt that I like needed to train for birth. I was so scared of giving birth to a child. I like everybody hears all the horror stories around that. So I thought if I could stay really, really healthy and really strong, like my birth would be so smooth and the baby would just come out and everything would be wonderful. <laughs> and there would be so little pain and I wouldn't need any drugs or an epidural because that was another thing. It was very important to me to have a natural birth. And thankfully I was able to do that probably despite of my heavy exercising, but I was also swimming 45 minutes to an hour, uh, six days a week, sometimes seven. And I was just exhausted all the time, just completely exhausted. And I just kept doing this every day. Like it was a compulsion. I felt like I had to, like I had to do this for myself and my baby for whatever odd reason. I, you know, your doctor always tells you if you get pregnant and you're overweight, you should lose a little weight. And you know, there's this constant dialogue in our society about, how we need to be as slim as physically possible. So I really got it in my head that that's the way that I was supposed to be regardless of what my hunger was telling me or my lack of energy. So following the birth of my child, I breastfed and she was a very demanding baby. So I was taking in a lot of calories at this point, but it was all whole food plant-based. And um, I did notice some weight loss uh, but I didn't think much of it. I just thought that my diet, I had finally come across the proper diet and I'm, I have always been a big um, exerciser enthusiast. So I just assumed that, all right, I finally found the right formula. <laughs> like this is, you know, how I'm supposed to live out my life. But I continued the intermittent fasting loosely because anybody who's breastfed, <laughs> that is a hunger unlike any other. And it was very difficult to keep up with the calories on a whole food plant-based diet if I wasn't like really well organized and prepared ahead of time. So initially for about the first year I was breastfeeding, I was able to keep up with the calories and I didn't do any extreme intermittent fasting, but then COVID hit. And during this period, I was three years into a dietetics program. And at that point, like I had been on this plan for all these years that at some point, as soon as I complete the necessary requirements in Wisconsin, I was able to then travel to Florida to continue and complete my degree because it was a coordinated program. And I always wanted to live in Florida, so I was like, win-win. But I got to the point where I was supposed to quit my job and move to Florida, so I quit my job and my husband actually lost his job the same day that I quit my job. We had also sold everything that we owned fairly pretty much that didn't fit into a little trailer that connected to our car and everything was set and we were ready to move to Florida. Come to find out because Florida was such a hot spot at that point in time at the very beginning of the pandemic, 
long story short, my husband was not able to move to Florida and I was not about to make the choice to leave my family to continue my dietetics program. So I had to leave that behind. So we got stuck in a transitory period where we were staying with family and that turned really ugly and we had to find a place literally within like three days with this one-year-old and it was like in the middle of this pandemic and it was unbelievably stressful. So I think something like triggered in my brain where I needed to conserve my resources, um, mainly my finances and my calories. So I began restricting very severely. I wasn't eating until eight or nine in the morning and then I would stop eating at like two o'clock in the afternoon and I would not allow myself any more calories and just saying it sounds so crazy. But I think for anybody who's been through like a really stressful life event, like we do some pretty strange things sometimes to cope and to rationalize like how to move forward through that. I also want to mention, oh, sorry, let me collect myself. <laughs> I think it's also really important to mention that during this time I was reading books like How Not to Diet by Dr. Michael Greger. For example, to preload with so-called negative calorie foods. Negative calorie preload just means starting out a meal with fruits, vegetables, soup, salad, or simply a tall glass of water. All right, so another one, the two teaspoons of vinegar with every meal, um, apple cider or any other kind. I recommend uh, um, uh, people do that. And Becoming Vegan by Brenda Davis. And I was listening to a lot of videos by Joel Furman. That's the thing we're saying about moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. That H equals N over C means your healthy life expectancy and how youthful, vibrant, intelligent you're going to be as you age and have good health is related to the micronutrient per calorie density of your diet throughout your life. And all of these people really promote this like hyper focus on nutrition and getting optimal nutrition and nutritional excellence and doing these odd behaviors to maintain an unnaturally slim physique. Like Joel Furman, for instance, always advocates for eating a lower calorie diet than what your body really needs. Like skipping a meal once in a while is always a good idea and moderate caloric restriction in an environment of nutritional excellence. I believe that's his line. I really took that to heart and thought that I was improving my health and longevity by being as slim as physically possible and maintaining this like really artificial leanness for the sake of health. I don't know why that made sense to me at the time, but also Dr. Greger's How Not to Diet has so many strange, um, behaviors that we can do like adding certain spices and stuff to our meals and just I got really rigid about all of those rules and all of those t all of those little um, pieces of information that I was learning from these doctors so that's another reason why I'm advocating for doing a lot of your own research and fact checking as much as possible because I believed <laughs> these individuals because I held them in such high regard but even when you're listening to me, please feel the need to fact check and um, challenge anything that I pr bring up in my videos because it's really scary what we can do with our daily habits to lead us to a place of detriment with, with our health when we think we're actually doing the opposite. So I just want to put that out there. I also realized that a lot of these habits like the intermittent fasting, exercising on a fasted stomach, and um, calorie restriction, I attributed all of those things to the results that I was getting of not only my leanness, but also to seemingly improvements in my autoimmune condition. So uh, my digestion was getting better and I wasn't having so many joint issues and my skin was um, a lot better. Um, I have celiac for anybody who doesn't know and also dermatitis herpetiformis, which is the skin condition of celiac basically. And it's awful <laughs> for anybody who's had it. It is like, it's worse than poison ivy. It's like these awful fiery blisters and they itch so bad. It's yeah. So I've always had a lot of um, complications for my celiac that I thought this intermittent fasting and um, super low fat whole food plant-based diet and absolutely no salt. I thought all of these things were helping me um, when in fact it was doing quite the opposite. So another thing that I think is pretty obvious that 
probably encouraged these behaviors was the fact that at this point I did also start doing a lot of blogging and YouTube videos and I was um, very much an advocate of a whole food plant-based lifestyle because of all of the wonderful um, health improvements I saw as a response to following that protocol. So I wanted to help other people uh, make that transition, people who like really felt that that was what was right for them. So when I started doing my YouTube videos, I happened to do one that had to do with weight loss and how much weight I had lost through eating a whole food plant-based diet and intermittent fasting and so on and so forth. And that video really took off and all of a sudden people really took to my weight loss videos and my weight loss blogs. So that was kind of the direction I took. I always wanted to be a health coach. Now I was becoming a health and a weight loss coach. So <clears throat> obviously I felt I had to obtain and maintain this very slim physique that um, I couldn't teach other people how to do how to have a lean body if I didn't have one myself. So I felt that constant pressure of keeping up with these habits and just saying it out loud, it sounds so silly, but. So basically you have seen my evolution of what was completely innocent and just very misguided learned behaviors that turned into just a mess of health complications from the pregnancy to the breastfeeding to the COVID and moving and changing my career trajectory and becoming a health coach and following all this misguided information. I believe that this is how I created the perfect storm in my body and in my thought process, thinking that this was okay and actually a good idea <laughs> to be doing. So before I close out this video, I just wanted to give you guys kind of a, a picture of the symptoms I was experiencing. So if you are having any of these types of symptoms or a cluster of these, you might want to check into um, your primary care physician or a dietitian or anybody who is familiar with red S or hypothalamic amenorrhea. Red S if you're over-exercising or if you don't even think you're over-exercising, but your body thinks you're over-exercising. <laughs> Uh, in my case. So some of the things I noticed early on were like extreme rigidness and a loss of my sense of humor. Everything started to revolve around my food and exercise. So everything else was um, not as much of a priority. It became very isolating the way that I was living and I definitely put my family under unnecessary stress that I will always have to regret. So some other things that I had early on are being cold all the time. Your body is no longer capable of maintaining a comfortable temperature when it is under fueled, if it gets to that extreme. So that is a telltale sign of starvation. And then extreme insomnia, your body is too your cortisol and your adrenaline are too high when you're in an extreme calorie deficit your mind will try to get your body to start looking for food so it, you'll have these constant thoughts about food instead of being able to sleep at night and you're probably going to be initially very hungry to the point where you'll have like the physical sensation of hunger but later on when it gets to the to an extreme that your body no longer has enough energy to um, provide those physical hunger signals, then it will just give you the, the mental hunger signals where you can't stop thinking about food. So I also started to have constant nocturia, which is um, nighttime urination. So I had to get up multiple times in the night to use the bathroom. And between insomnia and having to get up all the time to use the bathroom, it was, it was really um, impossible for me to sleep. But also I would have a lot of, and, and this developed, um, rather quickly I feel and the severity just got worse and worse and worse as the years went on. So um, I'd have a lot of urinary frequency and incontinence and urgency and I, all this time I just thought oh I just had a baby so this must be you know a result of um, some pelvic floor damage or something that most women just have to live with. It, it didn't even occur to me that this was something that I was causing myself. I also had a lot of frequent injuries from my over-exercising. That's a part of the red S, the relative energy deficiency in sport. And I was also sick a lot. So I had a lot of colds and a lot of flus. 
So that's um, another telltale sign of the red ass. Eventually, I also noticed a lot of constipation and bloating. Now, I had no idea I was constipated until I actually got an x-ray. Um, we'll talk about that in the next video when I discuss more about how I discovered that I had hypothalamic amenorrhea and that whole process with all the different specialists I had to see. But I did notice that my stomach had been rather large, like the rest of my body was perfectly slim. And then I had this like a six to eight month looking pregnant belly. It, it was very confusing. I just assumed that I was eating a lot of you know vegetables and fruits and whole foods that my stomach was just that much larger. Like it needed to hold, you know, all those pounds of vegetables and such. But apparently there was um, some excess bloating that got to a point where I'd have to wear different pants in the evening. It was, you know, the Ned wear in the, in the earlier parts of the day. So it was really confusing. Um, and I didn't think I was constipated because I had regular bowel movements. Like that's how constipated I was. It was, it was really, it was really bad. And hypothalamic amenorrhea actually uh, slows down your gastric emptying and your peristalsis. So your the movement of your food through the digestive tract completely slows down when you are not getting enough fuel because for one, it doesn't have enough energy to move all that food through your body. And for two, it is trying to hold on to every last morsel that is going through its system because it is so undernourished. So th those are the two main reasons why. Another complication I had was extreme fatigue and weakness. I actually had COVID in March of 2020. So we just always thought that I had symptoms of long COVID. Like I literally could not function after like two, three o'clock in the afternoon. I would just like shut down. Um, I used to call it turning into a pumpkin <laughs> at two o'clock every day because all of a sudden I literally became another person and I was just a zombie and it was, it was awful. I didn't have any room left for my baby girl and it was very difficult taking care of a toddler like that. This video is getting ridiculously long and I apologize for that. I did not um, intend for it to be so long, but I really want to give you guys a full picture of what was going on so you can help to diagnose some issues um, that may be occurring in your situation because this is unbelievably common and it's very concerning to me that not more people are aware of this issue. Some other things I noticed were irritability and pessimism. I was always on edge and if anything was out of order or went on, uh, um, anything was spontaneous that came up in my day, I just could not cope with it and I would fly off the handle and unfortunately my baby girl or my husband would usually get caught in that turmoil. So I feel awful about that. So some of the hormonal issues, like I mentioned, hypothalamic amenorrhea shuts down um, your reproductive system and uh, all of those, those hormones, like the luteinizing hormone, the, the follicle stimulating hormone, the estrogen, the estradiol, the, the testosterone, all of those things are uh, depleted because your hypothalamus is suppressed in environments of hyper stress. So again, things like overexercising, just being stressed in general, or undernourishing, those are all forms of stress that will suppress your hypothalamus and then uh, slow down these the release of these um, normal reproductive hormones and ultimately leading to not having a period or the uterine lining that you know leads to a period. There's no releasing of eggs or ovulation or any of that. So you will also experience symptoms of menopause. So I was having hot flashes and vaginal stiffness, vaginal dryness. And the last thing I want to talk about is the joint pain that ultimately led to arthritis in my neck. But before I found out about that, um, I was having horrible joint pain in my hip that led me to have to stop running. And for anybody who's known me, like running is my all time favorite thing that I used to do in my day and I haven't been able to do it in years because of all the damage that I've caused to my joints. So my hip, my shoulders, my neck, my lower back, like all of a sudden, like I felt like a 90 year old woman. <laughs> so um, it was very strange for me though that that continued. Like it's really strange that I still don't have a period, I still don't have a libido, and I feel like a 90 year old woman. So these were all of the things that kind of led me to um, finally reach out to the traditional medical community and start figuring out exactly what was going on in my body. And we will talk about that in the next video. Again, I apologize for this being so long. It's um, taken me a long time to get in front of this camera though and be able to talk about these things. So I really appreciate you guys 
sticking through to the end and um I hope you look forward to the videos I'll put out um, hopefully every week, if not every other week. I'm trying to be very kind to myself and compassionate about um, my stress and being more cognizant of how many things I stuff into my day and how stressed I get around, you know, making sure everything's perfect and getting everything done. And so, yeah, I'm, um, I appreciate all you guys for sticking around with me and reaching out to me and all of your really super sweet um, messages that you've been sending me. And so I so appreciate this community and all of the love and support that you've provided. Sorry, I'm so emotional. This has been um, a very eye-opening experience and just a major transition. So thank you all and I will see you in the next video.